Hello, welcome to Principles of Epidemiology. My name is Teresa Stack. I'm an assistant professor with Montana Tech of the University of Montana. And this is lecture two in our series called Infectious Disease and Disease Transmission. So today I'll cover the mechanisms in which disease is transmitted to people. You'll understand some of the descriptive measurements or terms that we use in epidemiology. And finally, we'll look at what notifiable conditions are for surveillance of uh, disease in the community. So just a reminder from um, our first lecture that we are basically trying to seek the truth. We need to know what the disease is, why it's occurring, when it's occurring, how it's transmitted to people, and where it's taking place. So again, these are our five whys, although our how isn't actually a why, but it could be considered a why too as well. And then we also use our uh, time, person, and place when we're looking at disease and epidemiology. This is the epidemiological triad, and it describes the ways in which disease is transmitted um, to people. And you have uh, four different characteristics. The first is the host. The next would be the agent. The third is the environment. And finally, the vector. And so we're going to talk about each one of these. First, when we look at the agent, so the agent was, oops. down in that area. The agent is the factor that is required to be present in order for a disease to take place. It was originally used, the term agent, for infectious diseases, but we can also use them for other types of health events or occupational illnesses. So for example, lead is the agent which causes lead poisoning. Latex is the agent which causes um, an irritation in the skin. Cholera is the agent, or, I'm sorry, is the bacteria is the agent which causes cholera. And force, posture, duration, and vibration are all physical agents which cause back strain. Your host, your host is the organism that harbors the disease. Your host can be an animal, a plant, soil, or it could be humans. And there are different um, characteristics of the host which cause people to um, develop disease. For example, age. Older people are more likely to develop bursitis. Um, sex. Um, women are more likely to develop osteoporosis than men. You also have race. Uh, African Americans develop uh, sickle cell anemia, which Caucasian people do not. Certain customs such as with the transmission of Ebola. We found out that um, it was the custom in which they deal with the dead bodies which proliferated that disease. And then we have other possible host characteristics such as your occupation. Only, um, well not only, but coal miners develop black lung disease. Whether there's a family history of pre-existing diseases, if you're in a geographical region or depending on the strength of your immune system. And then your environment has to do with the outside or the external conditions which allow the disease to transfer from host to um, the person or from the agent to transfer from the host to the person, such as temperature, humidity, altitude, crowding, housing conditions water quality, food quality, air quality, noise, again, geographical location. So these are all part of our triad. The natural history of disease refers to a progression of the disease in an individual or a host over time. So let's go back one more time and take a look at that slide. And you can see your host is your, the person that gets the disease, because we're speaking in terms of 
human population share. The different factors make a host more susceptible than others. We have our agent, which can be biological, chemical, physical, or nutritional, our agent. And then you also have your environmental conditions, which can, what I consider, modify um, the agent or the host, make somebody more susceptible or less susceptible. Sometimes, again, that environment is your carrier, such as when you have um, contaminated water or food. And we'll talk about the vector a little bit later. So this is just a generic way to look at the natural progression of a disease. So you have the start here. where people are disease free. And there's some type of exposure that takes place. So I was in a room with a whole bunch of children that were coughing, and I was exposed to the measles virus. And then you have your subclinical stage, which means that I actually have the disease, but because I don't have any symptoms, you don't know that I have the disease. Now, in terms of infectious disease, this can be considered an incubation period, taking time for the disease to grow in the body. Um, it's also a period in which you can um, give the disease to somebody else. A word just completely left my head. But that would be um, your transmission period. And then you finally have symptoms, and this is your clinical stage of when you have the disease. This is usually when you're diagnosed. And then um, there's some kind of natural results. Either you get medication, you recover on your own, you're disabled, or you die. So you have your exposure and your symptoms, your stage of susceptibility, subclinical, where you have a disease but you don't have any symptoms. There are pathological changes in the body, and you have your symptoms, it's usually when you go to the doctor and you're diagnosed or you're self-diagnosed, and then some natural progression. So each stage can vary with the characteristics of the agent, the host, and the environment. And the first stage is your susceptibility. And again, this is a pretty simplistic model. So when we talk about infection disease, infectious diseases, we call this area in here our incubation period. You have changes that occur in the body, pathological changes, but you don't actually have any symptoms. When you're talking about uh, a chronic disease, such as cancer, then this, this um, stage in here, instead of being called the incubation period, is called the induction period. So if you have screening done in this period of time, where you have subclinical disease, which means you're not showing any symptoms, but you have screening done and they're able to detect the pathological changes, that's where an intervention could be put into place early before the disease develops, or the disease may not develop as quickly, or we might be able to cut down on the symptoms of the disease. So understanding the progression of the diseases is important in figuring out what we're going to um, do to um, protect people from it. So again, the period of communicability is when you can transmit the disease from one person to the other. And this happens when you have the biological onset of the disease. And a lot of times you're asymptomatic with communicable diseases versus a disease such as cancer, which is a chronic disease. Um, we don't 
we may be transferring that disease from one person to another, you know, that we transfer cancer from one person to another. But hepatitis certainly can be. But instead of it being an incubation period, we call this period the induction period. And that's where you're still asymptomatic, you have some biological changes, but you, 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 they don't manifest themselves, which cause you to get diagnosed. Unless there is, of course, again, screening done in this period of time, sometimes you can catch it before you actually develop symptoms. So this is an interesting um, graph which shows the annual incident rates of leukemia, leukemia following the atomic bomb among survivors who were residents <coughs> in Hiroshima at the time. And you can see that um, where the bomb went off. And you have um, the incident rate. Both peaked. approximately six years after the bomb went off, even though, um, but you had a higher peak, so you had more people developing new cases of leukemia closer to the bomb blast versus further away from the bomb blast. And then diagnosis is often just the tip of the iceberg. And what's submerged is we know that this many people have a disease in our population. 25 people have measles in the state of Montana. How many people are carrying the disease, but it has not manifested itself? So for every one person that gets the disease, there can be a number of people who are carriers and who are harboring disease or who may get the disease. So that's the difference between our clinical and our subclinical. And using that tip of the iceberg, oops, I skipped ahead too fast. Using that tip of the iceberg methodology. So many people will not develop the disease at all, even though you um, have the virus inside your body. And this is important um, for the transmission of diseases. So I can be a carrier, and I never have the disease myself. And one of the most famous uh, carriers was Typhoid Mary. And over many years, she worked as a cook in New York City, mo moving from house to house. She never developed typhoid herself. She was a carrier. And it is estimated that she contributed to at least 10 typhoid fever outbreaks, 51 cases, and uh, three deaths. So there's an example of a carrier. I carry the disease inside of me, but it does not manifest itself. I remain asymptomatic, but I can give the disease to somebody else. So what determines which individuals end up getting the disease and which individuals do not? And there are three terms that are used in epidemiology. The first one is infectivity, the proportion of exposed peoples, people, not peoples, people, who actually become infected. Pathogenicity, proportion of infected people who clinically develop the disease. And virulence, proportion of the people with clinical disease who become severely ill or die. So infectivity proportion of exposed people who become infected, pathogenicity, proportion of infected people who then develop the disease, and virulence, proportion of people who develop the disease and become severely ill or die. And we'll go through and we'll take a look at this and see how these kind of work together. So hepatitis A in children has a low pathogenicity and the low virulence. Infected children remain asymptomatic, and very few develop severe illnesses of hepatitis A. 
versus the measles. Measles has a high pathogenicity but a low virulence. Among all infected persons develop the characteristics of rash. So everybody infected develops some kind of pathological change, whether it's severe or not. But very few develop a life-threatening disease such as pneumonia or encephalitis. Among persons with poor nutrition, poor health, the virulence mortality rate is higher, as high as between 5 and 10 percent. So think about this. Measles is highly, highly contagious. And so if you are not vaccinated, um, or if you even if you are vaccinated, when you are um, infected with the disease, almost all people develop some kind of mild outbreak. Some people develop an outbreak that's higher than others. Um, but if you have poor nutrition, right, so this is part of your environmental factors, um, or are in poor health, you're more likely to die from the disease. And since we were talking about measles, I just thought you would want to take a look at um, the cases that occurred in since 2010 up to 2015. This is 2015 right here. This year, and this one is only through May of this year. But if we look at the entire year, wow, you can see we were close to 650 measles cases. So when looking at charts such as this, remember that we're, we're, we're trying to describe how many cases, how many, during what time period, what are we looking for, and what is our measurement period here. So you might have been misled to think that we only had mm, roughly 216 measles cases in 2014 if we didn't take a close look at how the data was broken out. So here, coming to May 1st of this year, which wasn't that long ago, you could see that there were um, many more measles cases in the United States than in the previous years. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the outbreak in California that then spread to other areas. So another example of putting together the severity or the virulence of a disorder with the pathogenicity of a disorder, rabies is highly pathogenic and highly virulent. All infected individuals who are not treated progress to the clinical disease and die. Rabies is universally fatal. Now there was um, one case just recently of a woman who was rather young, so she was in good health. She contracted rabies. They didn't put um, the prophylactic in place quick enough to stop it from progressing. So they induced a coma and put her in a coma why the rabies went through her body, and she was able to uh, recover from the disease. But usually it's universally fatal. When I was the public health director for Madison County, we had uh, law enforcement and medical providers who were required to report to us any and all animal bites. And if the animal wasn't able to be found, we had to recommend that prophylactics were given. They were highly recommended so that rabies would not um, take place because we don't know whether the animal had it or not, especially animals who attack. And dogs without vaccinations um, were required to be quarantined for 10 days to make sure that they didn't develop rabies. So we'll talk a little bit about disease transmission. Infection diseases, infectious diseases result from the interaction of the agent, the host, and the environment. 
The transmission of the disease occurs when the agent leaves its reservoir, is conveyed by some mode of transmission, and enters the susceptible host through a portal of entry. And this is called the chain of infection. The transmission of the disease occurs when the agent leaves the reservoir. Bats are notorious for harboring rabies, and Ebola as well. It's conveyed by some mode of transmission and enters the susceptible host through a um, bat bite. Um, you can also get it from your droppings. A portal of entry, typically injection when they bite, or through an open wound. Right? So this gives you an example of the reservoir, which is the disease inside the bat. The bat isn't sick, but it has a disease that when it enters our body, some mode of transmission through the bite, and the bite makes a wound in the skin, and that's how it's then transferred to us. So our reservoirs can be people, they can be water, they can be animals, they can be soil, they can be food. How is it transmitted to us? Um, through the air, through blood, through an animal biting with us, through us touching it, through us touching something and touching our eye or our nose, and then how does it enter the body, right? So through the digestive tract, when we eat it, through our skin, dermal exposure, through our mouth, our nose, or our eyes, or forced through the body in some kind of way. A reservoir is the habitat in which the infection agent lives, grows, and multiplies. And again, it can be human, animals, or the environment. Humans can be um, reservoirs, and that's when they're known as carriers. It's really troublesome when they remain asymptomatic, which means that they don't actually develop the disease, although they have enough to transmit it from person to person. Animals, we know, are very good reservoirs for diseases, and um, we pass them quite readily on to humans. Birds are reservoirs for West Nile virus, rodents for the plague, plague several mammals, dogs, rabbits, bats, raccoons are reservoirs for rabies. And the zoonotics, if you go through and you click on the link, I'm on slide. 31, there's a huge list of diseases which can be transferred from animals to humans. Environmental factors, soil, water, air, can serve as reservoirs for certain types of agents as well. And our mode of transmission, so direct contact with the disease, agent um, through droplet spray, such as sneezing, um, whether it bores into your body, um, like a mosquito, or enters through an opening, gets in your eye or ear or your nose. Indirect contact is when something um, lives in the air for long periods of time, or vector, and that's when it's, um, uh, we'll talk about vectors in the next few slides. So I thought this was a really interesting slide about Ebola. Ebola does spread through the air, but it is not transferred via the airborne route because the droplets are so heavy, they fall down to the ground. And so they don't stay in other people's breathing zone long enough for you to contract the disease or for you to get a large enough dose to contract the disease. But something like measles, the virus is really small. It stays in the air for a long period of time. It can travel up to, well, it says chicken pox can travel more than 30 feet and live for hours, where Ebola doesn't travel much more than three feet, and it lives for a matter of minutes. So that's how our airborne diseases, which live for long periods of time, travel long distances, live when they come in contact with other things, such as water or a table, and then we're able to contract it, spreadable through the air versus spreadable through the droplets versus spreadable with direct contact. Can be person to person or direct contact with the soil or the organism. <laughs>
for example, gonorrhea spread by person-to-person -person contact. I can't get it once it leaves a person's body and sits on a toilet seat. I can only get it from another person. Droplet spread through the transmission, which occurs when it's aerosols, when it's put in the air, sneezing, coughing, or talking. And hookworm is spread by direct contact with a contaminated soil. Airborne transmission occurs when particles are suspended in air. They usually travel for longer distances or live for longer periods of time. And of course, one of the most famous one was Legionnaire's disease, which was transmitted through the ventilation system in a Legionnaire's meeting. It was back in 1930s. Can't remember the exact date there. Sorry about that. And then we also have agents are transmitted transmitted in a vehicle. A vehicle could be food, water, or other biological processes, products. Um, the fecal oral route is one of the most common ones. Many intestinal diseases agents are shed in feces and carried on inadequately washed hands and transferred when somebody has dirty hands and they touch their food, or you touch your own food, and then you put your food in your mouth. Indirect transfer through a vector, most vectors are uh, anthropods, small bugs, mosquitoes, fleas, ticks. They carry the agent in their gut. They, it, sometimes they pick it up from one um, animal or soil, and it changes when it's inside their gut. And um, they, once they inject it into us, they give it to a new host. Um, sometimes there's more complicated roles in which vectors transfer disease from one person to another, but West Nile virus is definitely a common one that we're familiar with. And so a susceptible host would be, what about the person makes them more likely to develop a disease than other people? Plenty of people are bitten with mosquitoes that carry West Nile Nile virus, but only a few of us, so many of us are infected with the disease, but very few of us have pathological changes in which the disease manifests, and <clears throat> even fewer die from the severity of the disease. So what makes you more susceptible to a disease? And I think that we, um, oops. I think that we understand that there's genetic factors, there's health factors, nutrition. Some people believe there's socioeconomical factors, which makes sense with um, immunizations or people living close together or not having access to clean water or clean sanitation facilities. And there's a really neat video here, and I am on slide 40 if you wanted to go through and see it. I can't do it when I'm recording at the same time. I'm sorry about that. But it talks about uh, acquired immunity through a herd, as well as um, your, your herd spread your diseases as well. And so I'll show you here, because the picture really shows you that um, If one person has a disease and only a few people are vaccinated, then the disease is likely to spread through a population because you have carriers who are infected and they transfer the disease. But if you have one person who has a disease and lots of people are vaccinated, we don't spread the disease, it's more contained. So you put other people at risk when you choose not to get vaccinated or you choose not to vaccinate your children. You don't only put yourself and your children at risk. So it's for the better good of the community when people are vaccinated to stop the spread of a disease. And I understand why people are against vaccines for many reasons, but I think it's quite misunderstood. Some people will say, well, I'm afraid of the 
vaccination. So I won't get vaccinated and I'll assume the risk if I get sick. And that's true, you may get sick, but you're um, an infant child that has a lower immune system and a older person who may have a lower immune system is more susceptible to the disease and therefore you may get a mild case but give them a severe case and these people end up dying and you don't. So there is something about community for the better good and um, you know we virtually, not we, but polio was virtually eradicated and my very good friend who is 56 years old this year was one of the first rounds of people who received the polio vaccine and now um, occurrences of it are really low because lots of us are vaccinated. We know how it is transmitted and we're able to um, fight back the disease. The same thing with smallpox. But if we stop vaccinating for polio, then it'll start to come back and spread. Why we see such a widespread of whooping cough now in 2015 when we had done a pretty good job of knocking it back in 2005 because of a newer movement to not vaccinate. So now we're going to describe some terms in which are used to measure disease. So we, have, we already talked about the infectiveness of a disease, infectability, pathogenicity, and virulence. But the next few slides talk about other measures or descriptions in which we talk about a disease. So I'll show you a graph on the next slide. But you, you always have an endemic level, um, background level of a disease within a population. An epidemic, also, concern, also called an outbreak, is when you have an increase in that disease. See, we had, there's always a background level of Ebola in Africa. But we had an epidemic last year because we had a huge increase in the number of the people that contracted the disease. Now that disease did not turn into a pandemic. A pandemic would mean it was a global epidemic. It was still an epidemic because um, it, it, it was somewhat isolated. One or two cases in the United States would not be considered pandemic. So endemic, number of cases in Montana over time. You yeah. have a, a pretty stable level versus looking at an outbreak. And a endemic, again, versus a pandemic is an epidemic that occurs on a global level. And this shows the influenza pandemic, plotting epidemics both in the United States and in Europe. Over time. So when a disease is higher than an endemic level, we try to describe it in terms of person who acquired the disease, place, where did the outbreak occur, and time, when did the outbreak occur, where versus when. So is the disease stable over time, endemic versus epidemic? Are there seasonal changes? Influenza peaks in February in Montana. West Nile virus would peak more in the summer than it would in the fall. Does the time dimension of the disease outbreak suggest a point source or a propagated source? One person, one index, ca index case that's causing the disease or disease that's transferred from person to person to person and cause a larger outbreak, propagated versus a point source. So some things in which we see point sources for and which we investigated in Madison County would be a point source, um, people eating at a restaurant and developing food poisoning. The point source could be narrowed down not only to the restaurant itself, 
but potentially the food in which the people ate that caused that outbreak versus a propagation of a disease. Think about how Ebola was propagated through the population. And they use histograms a lot to be able to describe this. So this shows more of a common source. We had a couple of cases. We had an incubation period here. Cases rose, reached their peak, and dropped off again. Versus a propagated outbreak, we had cases, and more cases. Cases cause more cases. Sometimes you just see a decrease as well. So is it sporadic? They rarely occur. Endemic, there's a flat rate over time. A point epidemic, there's a clear peak which drops off or a propagated, check, um, propagated epidemic, you can see that there's incremental increases over time. Sporadic, endemic, outbreak or epidemic, propagating. We know diseases occur seasonally. We talked about that. Mumps show up in the fall, reaches its peak in the winter months. RSV does the same. Um, when does something like communicable diseases spread? More so in the summer and the winter. Maybe when people go on spring break. So are there trends over time? Do we see more influenza now than we did in 1940? Or do we see less influenza now than we did in 1940? Do you see <coughs> any trends? Changes in time can do to um, our increased interventions, putting them in place earlier, better medicines to treat patients, to subdue the symptoms. The incidence rate of AIDS has decreased since 1985 when we had an outbreak of it, but the prevalence rate has increased, meaning we have more people with AIDS in our population because people are living a longer period of time. And this shows that our death rates have uh, gone down even if our incident rates have stayed the same. So we do have cyclic changes over years and over time. And so this again shows place. Posted environmental factors that are associated with place, the levels of the agent or the vectors in an area, genetic differences in people within certain populations, anatomical differences between different races, geological differences, climate, population densities, nutritional practices, what people do, occupations, how they recreate. Urbanization, a lot of people living close together, access to health care. This has a lot to do with our place. It's how we define it and are able to better take a look at how disease is caused. I did that one already. Rural differences. Rural areas have higher literacy, illiteracy, joblessness, malnutrition, and disease. 
farmers have higher health hazards in some areas. They can be considered rural. Certainly OSHA doesn't come out and um, inspect. There's um, accidents rates for people that live in rural areas that are sometimes go unchecked. And we also have a bigger migrant worker population in our rural areas. I live in a pretty rural part of um, Montana. And what's interesting about our migrant workers is some of them are afraid to go in for health care because they don't speak the language and they also don't want to be removed from their uh, job. So urban areas, concentrated areas, um, higher likelihood of air pollution, violent crimes, uh, drug abuse, kind of the difference between rural and urban. And how we differ by person, right? Person, place, and time. Age, gender, ethnicity, social economical backgrounds, different kinds of biomarker characteristics and our behaviors. Age, women are three to 11 times more likely to develop a work-related musculoskeletal disorder later in life than men are. That takes a look at sex and age differences. Chronic diseases most likely occur, more likely occur in people, older people versus infectious diseases are more likely to develop in young people. Also the severity of the outcome, young people recover from pneumonia quicker than older people do. Dental problems are more common in older people than in young people. Looks at ways in which we can put our interventions in place. And the contrast in morbidity and mortality between males and females is pretty um, striking. Mortality rates for males is higher than in females. Men are more likely to die than women, but women are more likely to develop disease. Morbidity rates are higher for females than in males. Death rates for males vary by whites and non-whites. So we talked about gender already. Ethnicity, there's some diseases in which certain populations only contract certain ethnicities. Um, of course, exposure varies by population or by occupation. Right? Fibrosis among minors, asbestos and asbestos workers, mesothelioma among asbestos workers, bladder cancer among people who work with dyes, chromate exposure, um, different types of um, lung cancer associated with what people do. Air traffic controllers are found to have higher rates of hypertension and ulcers than um, coal miners and rare diseases by certain groups. And of course there's trends versus United States versus other countries as well. So just quick a few slides on what Notifiable cases are, notifiable condi con conditions are which um, federal and state officials, healthcare providers, law enforcement individuals must um, report these cases. And this is our passive surveillance versus our active surveillance. Some things are hepatitis A and B, influenza, measles, pneumonia, mumps, rubella, and these are reportable cases. So when I worked in Madison County as the public health director, every uh, week I would send out a reminder email to all the county law enforcement agents and the care providers and give them a list of what the reportable cases are. They would report it back to me and then I would send the information to the state and they'd compile it. So one thing that was really interesting is we were able to see a huge spike in influenza in Gallatin County and we didn't have it in Madison County and we thought that we might see a spike if we allowed the Gallatin County folks to come to Madison County and play uh, sports, right, because we're intermixing these two different populations. 
and um, therefore we can choose to inform our Madison County people that Gallatin County had an outbreak of influenza and they were coming in this area. Actually, in one instance, we um, had a high incidence of whooping cough in Gallatin County, and the public health director at that um, in that county stopped the Gallatin County School from traveling across the state where whooping cough did not have an outbreak because it's highly communicable and they felt that the incident rate was so high that they were going to transfer it to other students in a different area and they were able to um, stop a ball game from taking place. So how important it is with our data reporting in different areas. So I hope this gave you an overview of epidemiology and the triad of our host, who gets it and why, what do they get, what's the environment in which it's carried to you. The natural progression of disease, whether it's communicable or not, chronic, something like cancer. The different ways in which the agent is either in a reservoir or a vector, vector, and is transferred to the host. Why washing your hands and not touching your eyes is so important. We went through the different types and ways in which things are transmitted versus direct route and indirect. We also talked about the importance of the different ways in which diseases are either infectability, pathogenicity, and virulence, how many people uh, die from a disease versus how many people contract the disease versus how many people are infected in the disease and develop symptoms. Went through a little bit of herd immunity, endemic versus epidemic versus pandemic. Time, person, and place. Have a great day.